Uh, so without further ado, I wonder if we could have our first question, which I think is going to be read out for us by Clive Perry. Thank you very much, Fiona. I always wanted to be on question time. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I have fairly moderate psoriasis, something that um, I've taken topical treatment for for the last 30 years, and I've had four sessions of UVB treatment. By sessions, I mean sessions over nine or ten weeks, so I think it's 24 per session. The very first session I had, it cleared it completely. I couldn't believe it. And for three months, I was free. The second, third, and fourth session, I've seen the clearance rates drop. Um, and it didn't matter how many more sessions I'd had on the last time, it wouldn't have completely gone. Bearing that in mind, I'd like to ask, how many sessions are considered to be safe, please? Thank you. Um Sandy, could we ask you to give us a view on that? Yes, so the sort of standard figure would be 350 treatments of um, narrowband UVB, so TLO1 in a lifetime. And we usually, not totally limit it, but to about 30 for each course of treatment. But we certainly, we're a bit flexible, so if you had... Um, say black skin, you could tolerate more. If you were really fair and had a lot of natural sunlight, we'd probably say a bit less, but that on average. Julia, any thoughts to add to that? Well, I was reading the, um, the guidelines that were uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2016, um, and I understood that you could have up to 500 treatments. Uh, if you were given 500 treatments, um, then you would be invited for a, an annual skin cancer check. Um, so I, I guess it's very much individually based and it's really up to your consultant dermatologist to discuss with you all of your um, you know, risk factors, your, your skin type um, and your sun exposure you know, previously uh, to sort of uh, make a decision that's safe um, for you. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, concerns something called the Kobner effect. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, can you offer any guidance to prevent a chest wound from developing psoriasis following surgery? Uh, Jonathan, could I ask you to give um, us a thought on that? Yeah, so the, the Kobner effect is, is getting um, the, the, whatever the condition is, in this case psoriasis, um, in a site of trauma such as a surgical scar. Um, and um, there's not that much written about it, but my take on the Kerbner phenomenon is, is that it's, it's, an, um, it's difficult to predict. It's even difficult to predict in an individual patient. So sometimes a patient will get a Kerbner reaction and other times they won't get a Kerbner reaction. Um, and so uh, if they've had one before, it doesn't necessarily mean to say they're going to have one again. Um, of course, the chest is a bad place for scars in, in the first place and getting hypertrophic scars thick scars on the chest is um, problematic anyway. Um, in patients in whom it's a large risk, um, our approach is to, well, first of all, um, if you're having surgery, surgeons do not tend to like to incise through psoriasis. So it's a good idea to get the psoriasis away um, from the site of the surgical um, um, uh, incision in the first place. Um, and then if, if you keep an eye on the scar post-operatively, um, and if you think Kerbner reaction is developing, is to treat it with potent corticosteroids um, quickly to stop it happening, or minimise it happening. Hmm. Uh, Julia, anything to add? With practical experience in your... It's very practice. difficult, I think. Uh, it's around about 25% of patients will, will get it, as I understand. Um, I don't think there is a, a magic wand or a, a special remedy that I can advocate to, uh, to prevent it from happening. I think, as Jonathan was saying, really, it's about trying to make sure that your psoriasis is in optimal um, control, really, in a non-active phase, if you can, before you have the surgery. But uh, that's not always possible, is it? So, um, yeah, treating it as early as, as it comes up. Mm. Thank you. 
Our next question um, is one for all of you, I think. Um, we're aware that certain food and drink might cause a flare-up of psoriasis. Is there one food and a drink which research indicates has a definite positive effect to stop flare-ups and control itch, etc.? Um, let's start at this end of the panel and work that way. And you can all let us know what your experience is. Uh, okay. Uh, not that I know of, I have to be honest. I speak to lots of patients who um, have feelings that one thing is a trigger and, and one thing isn't, uh, or, you know, is helpful. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there, there isn't anything uh, to suggest that um, there's a particular food that might, you know, reduce your, 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 your chances of, of getting a, a flare. Um, so really, you know, we've been learning that psoriasis is all about, you know, um, the whole body. It's all about, um, you know, cardiac risks and things like that. So for me, optimising the control of your psoriasis is all about, you know, a, hel a healthy, balanced diet, um, you know, a range of fresh fruit and vegetables, trying to keep it low fat, trying to keep your weight down. Um, and they're, they're the things that I always discuss with my patients as opposed to one particular kind of food or fruit. Or I know that blueberries are much debated on the, on the website at the moment, um, but I, I haven't heard anybody to, you know, I don't think that's, you can say that one, one thing fits all people really. Let's run along the road. So, Food is like everyone wants to change their diet. There is some evidence. So recently there's been a bit of evidence about intermittent fasting. So in Ramadan, there's a slight improvement in psoriasis for people who are fasting. Um, people who've got severe psoriasis less often use a Mediterranean diet or have a Mediterranean diet as well. So what we tend to suggest is a Mediterranean diet, which is healthy anyway lots of fruit and vegetables, oily fish, but also sometimes to intermittently fast, so the kind of 5-2 diet. And I have got, um, we're doing some work with the Vegan Society actually as well, because we have got a couple of patients who've become vegan and their psoriasis has got way better, which we wonder about dairy. And another people, sometimes if they omit gluten as well, they can get very much better. But it seems to be a really individual thing, I would say. So the message I'm getting at the moment is gluten-free, vegan, Mediterranean. Yeah. And sometimes but, don't eat but, at all. But, but try yeah. it. Yes, yeah. there's not one food they will yeah. one drink. Bruce, is that...? Um, yeah, thanks. Look, um, I'm a rheumatologist, so I'm not going to give you any advice about psoriasis. <laughs> I think we've got real experts here. But I think this is a really important question for everyone with almost all known medical conditions. I think people are becoming much more aware of do the things we eat have an impact on our condition. And I think... From our perspective, we see this, what is why would it do that? And one of the things um, I'm not sure if you've heard about, but we know that certain ways you can change how you are with how you're eating is not just with weight, but also there's an effect on the gut, all the little bugs that live in your gut. It's called the microbiome, and um, that is going to be an area which is really taking off from a research perspective. Um, there are some people who say they know what it is and what you can do about it, but that's a bit early because we still don't really understand the microbiome but and if I think in the next five years or so we'll have a much better idea and, and then we know that diet has an effect on the microbiome and so there is a way you can see how these things could translate in to individual outcomes but ev everyone will have a different microbiome so this is one of the reasons why you're seeing different um, recommendations because uh, certain diets will be good for certain people and I think that's where you have to do some experimenting as Sandy uh, said. Thank you. Um, so seconding what everyone said, diet can play a really large role. I've spoken to a lot of people with psoriasis and what I've noticed is that everyone has their own specific food triggers. So um, my food triggers, if I eat things like tomatoes and sugar, um, I will itch within 20 minutes. It's quite an instant reaction. So it was quite easy for me to spot. Um, but uh, sensitivity gl to gluten took much longer, so I have a very delayed reaction when I eat that. And the research around a gluten-free diet is interesting. So the academic studies show that if you have blood markers that you're sensitive to gluten, 
even if you're not confirmed as celiac, having a gluten-free diet will help. But if you don't have any of those blood markers, then a gluten-free diet doesn't help. And it's the same with dairy. Some people cut out dairy and find that their skin improves. Some people don't. There's so many different diets. I've tried so many different diets. Most of them taught me something about myself. And one of them made me very, very ill. So to anyone with psoriasis, I would recommend employing a nutritionist. I find, found it was incredibly affordable, way less expensive than I thought it was. I only needed three sessions. And in that, we optimized my digestion. So just following on from what you were saying, um, intermittent fasting helped and she helped increase my stomach acid and all of these improvements in digestion improved my skin as well. So it's very personalized. I would stay away from the traditional psoriasis diet where you have to avoid gluten, nightshades, dairy, and try and find your own personalized route. Thank you. Jonathan. Well, no, I agree with all of that. I mean, this is obviously, um, it's a, a personal choice and, and, and these personal examples. I mean, as I said in my talk, um, the, the, the one bit of advice that we can say is that if you eat too much and, well, if you eat too much, and you drink too much and you smoke too much, that's not very good either for you or for your psoriasis, and that's been proven. Um, and so, so um, even if we don't know what specific foods that we can pr provide advice for in the clinic, given the individual nature of this, is um, a good holistic living and weight stability is good. Thank you. Our next question... Uh, is an interesting one. Uh, in the future, will people with psoriasis stroke psoriatic arthritis continue to be treated by a dermatologist stroke rheumatologist, or will an immunologist be more appropriate? Well, let's start, Jonathan, if we start with you, and then we'll move on to Bruce, so you can uh, argue um, it out. I don't think it's likely that an whatever an immunologist is, um, is likely to take over from dermatologists and rheumatologists in the near future. Um, the, um, first of all, dermatologists and rheumatologists are immunologists, uh, because we have to, because those are the medicine we use. Um, there isn't a proper specialty of clinical immunology, really. All the clinical immunologists do is look after people with immunodeficiency syndromes, which is not really relevant to um, psoriasis. Um, I, I think personally, and I would say it, wouldn't I, because I am a dermatologist, um, but I know for a fact that um, how easy it is, when I see a patient with psoriasis and joint disease, I know how easy it is to misdiagnose the joint disease. And it wasn't until I started working very closely with Bruce that, you know, joint disease and psoriasis is not all psoriatic arthritis. And so you need someone with pattern recognition skills in the particular bit, because you, it's not just about the treatment, it's about getting the right diagnosis in the first place. So I think it's, it's easy to get psoriasis wrong, it's easy to get psoriatic arthritis wrong, so, um, and we're all immunologists, so I think for you lot folks, I think you've got us for the time being. <laughs> So, so you can see why we work together, because we always agree on everything. But, um, so it's actually um, it's a real pleasure to be invited, and thank you very much. Um, so so we, we work very closely with the dermatologists, because probably the people with psoriasis, it ranges from 7 to 40% might get psoriatic arthritis, and it's partly to do with, there's, um, if you have very mild psoriasis, you're probably more less likely to get it. There's a whole lot of reasons. But, um, and I think um, that is the thing. I can imagine... It would be wonderful if you had a doctor who knew about everything, because then they could be an expert on almost everything that was happening to you. But um, I think these days things are becoming so specialised that that's why we have rheumatologists and dermatologists and gastroenterologists and people. The key thing is if someone comes to see me with joint pains and psoriasis, the big thing is, is it psoriatic arthritis? Because there's probably less than 50% chance it is. It's probably something else. It's just because... Uh, the other things are quite common. Um, and so having the right diagnosis and also be able to treat that kind of joint problem is really important. So um, if you had an immunologist who knew everything, then that would be great. But um, at the moment, we think that specialisation is actually delivering really high-quality care. The key thing is for the specialities to talk to each other. 
So then you've got a person with two things. You've got a person with arthritis and skin problems. And so we, we meet once a week. We have joint clinics once a week. Um, and it's really critical that the two specialities have very, very joined up ways of thinking and looking after people and discussing so our patients can actually see us and talk about how they are with us together because that means you get a joined up way of thinking and the, the best outcome for that person. The problem with the silos, like having a rheumatologist here and a dermatologist here, is if they don't sort of understand and they don't talk to each other, then the poor old patient in the middle gets a bit sort of sort of lift, left her out. And that key thing of joint working together is really important. And that's one of our ongoing um, sort of messages to encourage our colleagues to work closely. And I think that's working because once you do have that relationship, because also if you come and see me and you have a rash, I'll go, well, that might be psoriasis. And then you go and see um, Jonathan, then chances are it's probably not psoriasis because I'm not actually very good at diagnosing skin rashes. So it's really important you get the specialities, but they talk to each other. Thank you. Um, Julia, is that something you see in your work? I think that, um, that interplay between the definitely we we well I have to say that um, I work in South Buckinghamshire NHS Trust. We don't have um, extensive uh, collaboration like that. We do we do try. There's obviously some level of communication, but we don't have joint clinics um, with with different um, specialities, which is a shame. And I think it's something that obviously we'd really love to have, but. Um, I know that um, we do share and review work separately, but um, I think the subject of immunology is being far much more uh, widely discussed in, in the nursing field as well. And it's really important that I think that nurses are understanding um, that, that, you know, the level of immunology, you know, at a different level. Um, I work with the BDNG, we're trying to educate nurses about skin, and um, it is a subject that we're really trying to promote. Uh, just to give nurses a bit more understanding of, of how, you know, um, treatments are effective. Thank you. Okay, our next question perhaps um, links back to uh, one of our earlier ones, but um, uh, it, it relates to um, light treatment. Um, do, the, uh, do the benefits of sun exposure to psoriasis outweigh the risks of melanoma? So natural light treatment, I suppose. Sandy, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Is it something that comes up? <laughs> it does. It does come up because a, a lot of people feel disempowered with psoriasis to get the treatment they need at the time they need it. So, kind of resort to going on holiday to clear their skin in sunny climes. But I think the the question again is nuanced as with the number of treatments you can have with phototherapy so if you've got what we call skin type one so really fair skin then then if you burn in the sun then the risk and you've got a family history of melanoma the risk would outweigh the benefit if you have black skin then you can tolerate a lot of natural sunlight and if it works for you it's it's safe to use it so I think again it's as with a lot of the answers it's an individualized uh, risk but in general, what we advise is that you don't burn when you go in the sun and that you go in the sun sort of earlier in the morning and later in the day rather than over the mid-summer mm -hmm. days. But we've got lots of ways to control psoriasis now, not just natural sunlight. Thank you. Uh, Gemma, is that something that you've come across in your... Yeah, well, I or have personally this, or more broadly. Yeah, personally. So yeah. I've gone on holiday purely to treat. In fact, when I was 20, I got signed off work for a week to go on holiday to treat psoriasis. So that is an option, it turns <laughs> out. Um, again, it, it's to do with balancing the risk. I went on holiday with a dermatologist last year, and that was interesting. Um, she kept reapplying my sunscreen, and I was trying to tell her I was treating psoriasis. So we came up with a compromise. I was on a high sun factor and only went out in the mornings and the afternoons, and my skin did improve. Um, while I was on holiday, though, I was, I was curious, and so I put a poll on Twitter. So not academically sound, but I was horrified by the results because several people told me they intentionally burned to clear their psoriasis. So obviously when it comes to that kind of thing, um, that's not safe at all. So I think if you're unsure, it's probably best to go and speak to a doctor who will help you come up with a, a realistic treatment plan for how you can expose your skin based on your history of melanoma, your specific skin type and your history of burning. Thank you. 
Our next question uh, really goes back to the links between psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis um, and is quite short and to the point. Uh, why do some people with psoriasis get psoriatic arthritis and others don't? Jonathan, we'll give you first go at that. Well, one, I answered I that earlier on. I think right, you, but... you touched upon that earlier on. Um, it's all down to the genetics. Uh, it is in great part down to the genetics, yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, I talked to you about this HLA thing, uh, HLA CW6. I mean, the interesting thing with psoriatic arthritis is there's no association between psoriatic arthritis and HLA CW6, or very little. Um, so, so there's quite clearly um, differences between the populations of patients who have joint disease and those who don't have joint disease. Precisely what they are is actually very, very difficult to establish because um, the experiment is difficult because there are very, very few people on the planet with psoriatic arthritis who don't have psoriasis um, and consequently trying to work out what's going on in their genetic profile in the absence of psoriasis is very, very difficult indeed. Um, but I, I, as, as ever, um, it's a combination of your, what you inherit and your life's experiences. And um, you know, it may well be that there's something in the microbiome or, or, or whatever, or what you're eating or whatever. We just don't know. We have no idea. Bruce, is that, do you see patients without psoriasis but with psoriatic arthritis? Um, that's true, we do. Um, a sort of small number, like yeah. about 8%, 9% will have psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis the day before they get psoriasis. Also, there's some people who have psoriatic arthritis, but they'll have a family history of psoriasis. So that's quite common. Um, so that's the biggest group we see. So that comes back to Jonathan's genetic component. Um, but the key, the key genetics is also then usually linked to the environment and the link in the environment. And one of the things we were talking about, the Kobner phenomena for skin, um, it's interesting that there is an in there's a sort of increasing awareness that some of the things which we see in psoriatic arthritis may be also due to repetitive trauma at tendons and where you, how your, can, your body handles that. Some people, they will just, we always have a little bit of injury to our tendons every time you walk and things like that. But if you have a, the genetics may actually be making that more persistent and then you get a bit of arthritis next to that because the tendons are right beside the joints. So that could be one of the ways which they link and it could be that this Kobner phenomena which you see in the skin is also maybe happening in the joints and that could be partly genetic. Um, so we're really starting to work our way through. Um, there's some very interesting groups of people where, um, say, Toronto in particular, Dublin, where they're following people with psoriasis who have been checked by a rheumatologist, so they know they haven't got psoriatic arthritis, and they see over time why some people get psoriatic arthritis. Now, this has only been going for, say, um, sort of five, ten years, but with, with that, more of those sort of uh, studies will get a much better idea about the things which lead, and also that them, actually they're getting blood samples taken and things, just like when you go and see Jonathan, you get all this stuff. Um, we actually, the mechanisms will probably become more clear, which would be good because then we could maybe try and give certain people with psoriasis maybe something to prevent psoriatic arthritis. That would be the, the long-term aim. But um, at the moment, we're still not sure. We haven't got enough idea about how to stop it. Jonathan, you want to... I was just going to say, the, the, the registry, this bad beer registry that we talked about, has uh, the, the, got, now got 16,000 patients with psoriasis in it. Um, that's now been going for 12 years. Um, and it's usually said in textbooks that most psoriatic arthritis occurs around about 10 years after uh, the, the skin uh, manifestations. Um, and so we've got this longitudinal, you know, we've got the 10 years of data, and we know that when they went, that the patients like you went into the registry, we know whether they did or didn't have arthritis. Um, and now 10 years later, we can go back and say, is that still the case, or have you developed arthritis? And then we can start looking um, and asking the question, why is that? So it may well be that we in the UK are in a very good place to try and answer that question. Thank you. And our next question, um, also uh, very <coughs> to the point, um, why does having psoriasis make you more prone to being overweight? And why would this be a problem? Sandy, can we start with you, and then we'll work up to the genetic end of the spectrum. <laughs> so, so I think convention, sort of, we tend to 
think that being overweight predisposes you to developing psoriasis so that there is evidence now that if people lose weight then their psoriasis gets better if um, overweight people lose weight then you also reduce the risk of developing psoriasis and it, the reason why it's not great to be overweight with psoriasis is really there's multiple factors so one is that we know now that having particularly um, fat around the middle it generates its own inflammation which which makes psoriasis worse and also may trigger psoriasis and the other thing is that drugs don't work as well so the treatments that we use don't work as well when people are overweight so biologics don't last as long people are more likely to get side effects from say taking methotrexate as well and then as Bruce was saying that if you're overweight and you've got psoriatic arthritis it obviously puts more pressure on the joints and then that makes it worse so for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis there's improvements in losing weight but I also wonder about the microbiome as well with obesity because they're linked so I think it's quite a complex issue Jonathan well, no, I, I mean, I, it's quite nice hearing Sandy say that because she wasn't here for my lecture, but I completely agree with everything you said. So the, the evidence is from, from this Mendelian randomization experiment I talked about is that obesity causes or, or, obesity can cause psoriasis or, or, or the increasing severity of psoriasis. That, I think, is beyond reasonable doubt. But there is no evidence that psoriasis causes obesity. Um, so it, it, so the, 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 it's obesity goes to psoriasis and not the other way around. And I think the evidence is overwhelming that that's the case. But, but also, if you have psoriasis, as you'll know, then it's difficult sometimes to exercise. If your mood is low, the tendency is to overeat or to drink too much, <laughs> which then has calories in it. So it, it's a really difficult area. I think it's challenging. So just one thing, I mean... Um, it's interesting, there's certain types of arthritis. Some of them are arthritis in your hands and your feet. And there's another type of arthritis, which is pretty much in the spine, called spondylitis. And both can happen in psoriatic arthritis. Um, and it's interesting that the, the, the arthritis that affects the spine doesn't seem to have any association with, with weight at all. Um, and so uh, the arthritis that is associated in the hands and feet, that's much more associated with sort of being a bit overweight, like uh, with, you, with psoriasis. So, so again, it does show this link between things that go on in your body and then maybe the microbiome or whatever and also the genetics. So this interaction, and that's why it takes a while to work it out, but this is where things like the bad beer and things is really helpful because mm. we have loads of people, so you can actually then start to see things much more quickly than if you just look at a few. Thank you. Now our next question uh, comes in two parts, uh, and I think it's probably one for, for each of you. Um, uh, I think that the first part of the question I suspect will be a pretty clear answer to. Uh, the second part, um, perhaps less so. So, uh, do you think that patients with psoriasis should be able to access psychological services more readily? That's the first part. Uh, how would seeing a psychologist help my skin? That's the, the second part. So let's start at this end and we'll work along. Julia. Um, I think that uh, definitely there's, um, it's important to, uh, you know, engage really uh, with a psychological support if you can. I think it has a huge impact on people. Uh, my nephew, when he was in his early 20s, he developed psoriasis and I'm talking to him, you know, very close connection there with him and seeing the, the enormity of it all in his life. I just really want, that was the first and primary thing for me. I really wanted to help him to develop a bit more robust ways of coping um, psychologically in order for him to be able to deal with all the practical side that psoriasis throws at you. Um, and, and I think there is a services available. Um, that you can self-refer to. There's um, IAPT, which you will have heard of, improving access to psychological therapies, and that's a, a referral that you can do without the need for anybody supporting you. You don't need to talk to your GP. You can self-refer. And they offer group consultations and, you know, for acute situations. They can, you, you can have telephone conversations with um, uh, therapists. And they, they can really equip you, I think, to, to live with chronic disease and to help you to learn how you need to cope with um, 
all, you know, all the things that chronic disease, uh, you know, brings, mm. empowering people, really. Thank you. Sandy? So, well, yes, is the answer. So, so we're really fortunate to have a psychologist within our service. So we tend to use a multidisciplinary approach with psychology. And I would say the psychologist has changed my practice more than anything else. And what she does for people with psoriasis and what we've learned hopefully to do a little bit um, is to help people firstly deal with stress because psoriasis causes stress, stress makes psoriasis worse. And then it, so she helps people learn the tools to deal with it. And so things like um, a lot of people with psoriasis, when they feel that people are looking at them, they're feeling, thinking bad things about the psoriasis, she lets people give some tools to deal with that um, to do with losing weight as well, so the stress that makes you eat more that then helps you lose weight. And I think, I would say she changes people's lives more profoundly than I do, even with the biologics, because having a psychological intervention, say when you develop psoriasis in your 20s or your teenage years in particular, if you learn the tools to live with it without it affecting your life, that's a lifelong skill that you have and if you think about the things that stop you doing things with psoriasis it's often not the psoriasis it's the way you're feeling about it or the way you think other people might be feeling about it so psychology can really help with that I would say a resounding yes we don't have enough psychologists Bruce you thoughts um, about well I think yeah we um We've seen the, the one of the things that rheumatologists probably don't quite understand is how much psoriasis really affect, makes people um, feel pretty bad sometimes. And I think the the amount of resource available is there's two things: there's the recognition that it can help, and I think that's the first thing that rheumatologists probably need. So we have two psychologists in our department now because arthritis also makes people um, have challenges and got to cope with those sort of things. But I think psoriasis is probably more of a challenge than arthritis, and I think we've learned from our from Jonathan and working with that group, that um, huge impact that helping people be able to cope with it has. Um, so yeah, it's a very important aspect. Yeah. Gemma. Yes, you also want to talk earlier. <laughs> um, if my children got diagnosed with psoriasis, the first thing I would do is book an appointment with a psychologist. I think it's really important to learn how to deal with the challenges straight away instead of doing what I did, which was um, find short-term coping strategies which worked at the time, um, like not making friends with anyone who lived near me so they didn't call around on Cocoa's night. Um, because now, after 32 years of picking up really bad coping strategies and then becoming habits, I now have to go and unpick all of the bad habits that I've picked up all of the automatic thoughts when I arrive at a swimming pool or get changed in a communal area, they're just pre-programmed into my head and I now have to go back and unpick all of that. But I think something that does need to change is access. So I live in a really rural area and I struggled to get in for psychological support. Um, I went into a waiting list and after four months I hired a private psychotherapist because I just couldn't wait any longer. So it's good to hear about IELTS. I'd heard about them, but I thought my nearest clinic was Sheffield. But you can just ring up and... Yes, you can. You can ring up. If you, you know, Google IAPT, you'll have your local um, area uh, available. And they do telephone services for some people. I think you have to be kind of a little bit, uh, you know, struggling, uh, you know, significantly for them to do that. But there are, you know, there's that possibility. And I, I think they're an excellent service. And, you know, like you say, first thing on the list of my priorities for, for patients really one of the first things and that's fantastic because I was referred to psychology help because I was at my GP's in tears surprisingly um, and I was diagnosed with depression so I would have been eligible but I was never told about this service so it's really great that you're all here and we get to learn about these things from each other thank you Jonathan um, um, I agree with everything that said. Um, we have psychology um, embedded in our service, like um, Sandy um, and Bruce. Uh, it's fully recognised, and I think it's absolutely essential um, in this day and age to do 
good care. Um, and it's not just about the psychology of the condition, it's also about the psychology of the medicines as well sometimes. And, um, um, you know, some of the people have c completely legitimate worries about some of the medicines that people like us use. Um, and some kind of support there is, is, is really very, very good. And we're lucky it's not just the psychologists who do that, it's our, it's our advanced nurse practitioners who do it as well. It's absolutely crucial. Thank you. Our next question. Uh, I was told that I had to get a certain score on the PASI scale before being allowed to try biologics despite my psoriasis having a significant impact on my quality of life. Do you think the PASI is an outdated method of assessment with what we now know about the impacts of psoriasis being so significant? Jonathan, can we start with you and uh, we'll work um, this way. Yeah, so just to, in, in, the, in the developed Western world, just about the only country that insists on this PASI thing is the United Kingdom. Um, so the label for all of these medicines that we're talking about talks about moderate to severe psoriasis. It doesn't mention um, a number of PASI. It's NICE who decided for, for um, um, economic evaluation that they would use a PASI of 10 as a cutoff for cost-effective management. Um, so it's an issue that is a UK-specific one. Um, we... Uh, if you read the British Association of Dermatology Biologic Guidelines, or indeed the NICE psoriasis guidelines, um, it talks not just about PASI, but it also talks about high need sites. Um, so in other words, localised psoriasis in horrible areas where you'd rather not have it, um, and all, of, all being justification um, for, for these medicines if, if um, the patient's life quality is, is suffering as a result of it. Um, so it, it's purely financial, um, and um, hopefully as time goes by and costs go down, uh, things will change. We, we have a new care pathway um, in South London uh, where this goes back to the point, the question that somebody raised during my talk about, um, about um, biosimilar adalimumab, is because, because these medicines have come off patent, or some have come off patent, um, we've changed our care pathway, which is... Um, um, which has been agreed, um, which actually allows us to use these medicines when um, outside this, this PASI barrier in certain situations. So in other words, hopefully needy people who, who can get access to medicines who don't have a PASI of 10 can get them. Um, Thank you. Sandy, is, that, is this something you find yourself yeah, that's struggling a, with? Yeah, it's a huge issue because... There's a lot of people with psoriasis that has a massive impact on their lives who don't have a PASI score of 10, who at the moment are, are excluded from having biologics. But we're doing the same thing with the North London pathway as well to try and include people with what we call high-impact site psoriasis. So we will hopefully have a lot more flexibility, but the money is the big problem. So the British Association of Dermatologists guidelines are, are clinical guidelines, which are fantastic guidelines, but they're, they're not financially driven. So what the problem that we have is that the people who control the money don't recognise the British Association of Dermatologists guidelines because they're driven financially and looking for savings. So we hopefully will be able to get that line of our pathway in, but it hasn't been approved yet. But it's a, I think it's a very good question. Mm. Mm. Bruce, is this something that comes across your practice? Do you um, struggle yeah, with this um, sort of thing? Rheumatologists also have nice um, criteria for prescribing mm. biologics because we have very similar drugs to the drugs used in psoriasis. Um, and actually, it's sometimes it's interesting to work together because sometimes maybe the skin doesn't meet a pathway cutoff point, but maybe the patient might have a little bit of arthritis and that actually could meet the cutoff point. So, so that's actually one of the great advantages of working together because you have different ways of accessing these um, very similar drugs. Yeah. But the thing is, um, it's all about, again, um, working very closely with the people in your region who are the payers and showing them that you're treating people really effectively and that when you use these expensive drugs, you have to use them, but they're part of the overall treatment um, and if you're treating people well, then the cost is not 
huge because they're using very effective therapies. Um, and once they understand that, then they actually start becoming more flexible about letting you use these off-label, off-nice pathways. So it sounds like the South and North London teams are doing that. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Right, question number 10. There are many different forms of psoriasis which present differently and respond to many different treatments. Can we be sure that psoriasis is a part of a single disease category? Um, I think we'll start with Jonathan, who will probably draw a genetic... Um, no, I mean, it's quite clearly lots of different, lots of different issues, and even if it looks exactly the same. So um, it's clearly different from one person than another person. I mean, after all, some drugs work for some patients that don't, don't work for others, and there has to be a reason and a rationale for that. Um, so you, you, some it, people used to talk about uh, type 1 and type 2 psoriasis, plaque psoriasis, you know, depending on the age of onset. So if, you've got, if you're older um, and your psoriasis starts when you're an older person, um, uh, people talked about that being different from if it starts as a young person, even though it looks identical. Uh, and it's a true difference. They are, there are definitely differences, functional differences in the immunology and, func and differences in the genetics. So psoriasis is um, a range of overlapping conditions, um, but which will have a, a different makeup and profile depending on the patient. Julia, is that your, your experience as well from the people you see? Very much so, I, I think so, yes. It's, it's sometimes quite difficult when I'm, um, I've been writing a module for nurses on psoriasis and looking at the different um, uh, you know, areas of it. And really, we've had to narrow it right down and just make it chronic plaque psoriasis because there are so many different, uh, you know, you've got scalp, you've got everything. So, um, yeah, they're all different and they all respond differently to, to treatments and, you know, the, the difference in age as well of the patient, that's, that's something that I think has, you know, sort of come to my attention. When did it start? And, and that has such a big impact on, on treatment response. Thank you. Uh, our next question is a, uh, probably a familiar one to many people and uh, possibly one that you all have thoughts on. Um, my GP says he will only deal with one issue per appointment. <laughs> Yet I know from the Psoriasis Association I should mention if I experience heel pain, swollen fingers or toes, feelings of depression in addition to my skin, and they should check my blood pressure and so on. How can I have a conversation about all the aspects of psoriasis without him saying, I can only deal with one thing per appointment, when they're all actually linked? Thoughts about, I'm going to start with you, you uh, okay. Julia, and uh, some advice for what sounds like a... <laughs> A well, pretty common problem. It is, a, it is a common problem for all of us and um, you know I always empathise with my patients when they talk about their difficulties trying to get an appointment with a GP because you know it's the same for all of us here, we all struggle. Um, uh, you know, we've heard in the news as well how GPs are struggling with the services, there's a lack of GPs, they're struggling because they can't give empathy to their patients and that's hard for them as well. And the first thing we've got to get through to the, through the receptionist, haven't we? Uh, the receptionist is the first person that we have to talk to. And I think that there you have your opportunity. You can outline to the receptionist what you are wanting to discuss today and you know, perhaps um, suggest that a double slot might be necessary because you have more than one issue um, needing to be addressed uh, for this particular consultation. Um, yeah, um, I think as well there's a role for nurses in the surgery uh, because nurses look for you know chronic disease management. Uh, they they look at um, you know looking after patients with diabetes, you know, and and asthma and things like that. And I think although there's not really a chronic disease management for psoriasis necessarily at every surgery. I think, you know, perhaps there's potential for those nurses to be looking at the, the comorbidities and, and, and prevent, you know, looking at how we are then monitored. You know, that would be the ideal situation, I suppose, that they could do your blood pressure, they could uh, do your pest for you. I think as well, when I'm with my patients, I like to help them to recognise 
what care they are entitled to and I do like to direct them to nice guidelines so that they can you know, just glean over it before they see their GP um, and, and feel confident that they know what they're actually wanting. But of course, uh, humility and politeness is key if you want to have a good uh, consultation with your doctor. So I think just, just try to work with them, recognise their problems, know what it is that you want to get for your, from your appointment and, um, and, and just do, do the best you can, work as a team, really. Sandy, humility and so, politeness. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good way of getting what you want. But I, th I think it's a great question because I think people with psoriasis, that like you're all obviously here gaining knowledge and understanding what you <coughs> need. And often GPs are under immense pressure and they may not realize what you need in more than one way sort of emotionally physically your screening and I think to be in control of that yourselves is fantastic and um, also just to be empowered that you may not get everything from the first appointment but then perhaps make another appointment and I think people I've seen when they've struggled with their GPs it's often about not being followed up so if, if you go to your GP you'll be seen once and they don't necessarily arrange to see you again so it may be that you have one appointment and then follow that up with another appointment so they fully understand your experience and the other thing in dealing with people with psoriasis when you deal with your GP is to try and articulate what your life experience is because I think people who don't often deal with psoriasis, they often don't realise what the impact is on your life, so therefore you don't get the care that you actually need. So it's a hard thing to do. Thank you. Bruce, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, stuff? it's interesting. Um, so, um, I mean, the numbers of GPs per head of population has gone down in the UK in the last 10 years, so it's, this is subtly obvious why it's um, really hard to see a GP. It's not because they're all kind of working part-time. Um, so what I think is one of the things that's coming through with, with these places where we see loads of patients uh, over time, like in rheumatology, dermatology, you know, even there in our clinics, our consults with time restraint, is to think about how you, from a, from a perspective of, of the patient, how you get the most out of that time. And so having a think about what you want. Some people, if you come with a big long list, that tends to get people a bit kind of, um, oh, what's happening here? But try and think about the key things you want to talk about, like Sandy's saying. Uh, sort of don't go just as a sort of, okay, doctor, you run it. You actually got a point. You've got things you really want to talk to your doctor about because you know what things are troubling you. Um, and also, you know, what sort of, if you read a guideline, you could see what sort of opportunities could be available to you for treatment. Um, and so that idea of, it's a bit like called scheduling, you can have an idea about the kind of things you want to discuss with your doctor. And that help, helps the doctor a lot because they don't actually know what your priorities are. You do. So that really helps them sort of get your priorities and then you can start to discuss them. And if you find that you've only got maybe two or you got three then that's where you have to have maybe a double appointment or you come back in the next month or so hopefully to the same doctor and you can finish it off so so that actually adds a lot of value to that consult um, and I think that's something that's catching on in general practice and everywhere and I don't think doctors would be surprised by it they'd probably be it would probably be very helpful thank you Gemma so I have a podcast called the Psoriasis Geek Podcast and one of the first episodes I recorded was with a GP because one of the common frustrations is not being able to get help when I need it and he gave me some really good advice. He outlined this one problem per appointment situation and recommended booking the double appointment to which I said most surgeries do not want me to do that. And it turns out they actually do. And if the receptionist does give you a little bit of hostility, then it's your job to explain, as we've mentioned, exactly what your problems are. Because you saying you're struggling with your psoriasis means absolutely nothing to most 
people manning the phones or manning the reception desk in a doctor's surgery. You need to really outline the struggles that you're experiencing and they will either find quicker appointments for you or they will organise double appointments. Another tip he gave me was to book double appointments well in advance and then cancel them if you don't need it. So if you know that you need ongoing care from your GP, book those appointments three months in advance. The other thing he told me was about GPs with specialist training. So if you're going to a larger GP surgery where they've got six or more doctors, chances are one of the doctors there will have had additional dermatology training. Obviously, it's nothing on a dermatologist, but they're going to be much more empathetic to your needs and they're going to have much more experience connecting the dots if you're talking about several different challenges. And it's quite simple to find out if you've got one in your doctor's surgery because most websites have a staff list and you can see it in brackets at the end of their name. Or you can call a surgery and ask to see the dermatology specialist GP. Thank you. Jonathan, anything to add? To no, not really. No, I completely agree with all of that. I was, just, I was just thinking, slightly amusingly, one of the worst things you hear from patients is, while I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's a solid tip. Don't say, while I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> right. OK, I, I think we've got time for one, one more quite... Uh, a topical question, I suppose, or it seems topical to me. Um, it would be interesting to hear from all of you on. Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around CBD oil for the treatment of psoriasis, as well as for other medical conditions. Do you think that CBD oil may be considered for the treatment of psoriasis in the future by the NHS? Jonathan, can we start with you and work this way? That's... Um, I don't know what CBD oil is. It's oh, space. cannabis. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I, well, I don't know the answer to that, actually, except I, um, I have, anecdotally, I think that there is a bit of an association between cannabis smoking and psoriasis, I'm afraid. Um, I, um, I have a, a number of young patients in whom cyclical changes in their, their um, psoriasis uh, the, the, the state of their psoriasis has been um, temporally associated with um, smoking cannabis. But that's all I can say. I have, uh, it's complete anecdotal, and I, I don't know any more than that. Gemma, have you come across CBD oil debate? I uh have. -huh. There's a lot of people talking about using CBD oil. There's a lot of evidence for helping to reduce inflammation, helping to relieve the eight symptoms of many inflammatory conditions, but most of that evidence is in mice. So I personally am interested in trying it topically, but I think you've got to be really careful if you're going to start taking it, or well, more careful if you're going to start taking it systemically, because drug interactions are not well defined. Um, and if you are taking medication for your psoriasis, there could be an interaction with the CBD oil, and I think you've got to be really, really careful. Thank you. Bruce, is that something, you, something you've um, come across? I mean, a lot of off? people are interested in, in arthritis, and I think in almost every walk of life. Mm. Um, but um, the thing about us, we can only look at things that have been tested um, in proper ways, because um, you know, in arthritis in particular, um, we have huge amounts of placebo response. So there's nothing wrong with the placebo response. Everyone uses it. It's a very, very important part of getting better. But um, it we just means that we can't actually say if the drug's having an effect, or you think the drug's having an effect because of how it makes you feel. So, so we really don't know, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of research on it in the moment. Um, so we'll probably be able to give you a better idea in a few years. Yeah. Thanks. Sandy. So we've, we've got a couple of patients who use that. So one of, one of my patients actually is manufacturing cannabis oil. He gave me a little bottle of it, and I'd put it in my work bag, and then I was going through customs, and I suddenly <laughs> like, kind of remembered what was in my bag. So uh, luckily they didn't notice it, but that was slightly <coughs> hairy. But, so, so one of them, he takes it orally, and he says he feels a bit calmer on it, and his psoriasis has got a bit better. Another one of them um, uses it actually on the skin and initially he thought it was a bit better as with a lot of things and then subsequently he he doesn't think it's worked and uh, and like Bruce said we won't be able to use it in the NHS unless there is good evidence that it works and that takes time to 
create that. But we do need an effective cream treatment for psoriasis. You know, we've got great treatments for severe psoriasis, but to have something that works would be good, whether or not that's cannabis oil. Thank you. Julia, is it something you've come across? It's not something that um, I've come across. I did read briefly about it, and, and it does seem to advocate it's great for lots of inflammatory conditions, including MS and arthritis and things. But um, as Jonathan said anecdotally as well, I feel, you know, I do come across a lot of patients that are smoking cannabis, and while, you know, there's, you know, sort of benefits perhaps that they talk about, you know, from a relaxation point of view and a disconnecting from, um, you know, the reality of everything, um, I, I, I tend to sort of relate it really more with, with uh, exacerbation and, and relapse and everything. So I think it's a long way off if, if it is something that is out there for the future. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. I think our, our the clock has now caught up with us. I, I think the, uh, the, the thing which has struck me about uh, this afternoon's panel is that you've all been so much politer and nicer to each other than happens on the normal question time, <laughs> shall I say. Um, but nonetheless, I, I found it fascinating and very informative. Thank you all for your time and your answers. <laughs>